Once again, we want to welcome you to Milestone Church. I want to welcome those of you joining us by video, both online in our video venue and in our 1230 service. We're so glad that you're following along with us. We're here in week three of our Let's Talk Family series, week two of this Q&A format. And I got to tell you, as the people of Milestone, you guys did it again like you always do. A few weeks ago, we put this number up and asked you to send in your questions And you guys sent hundreds and hundreds of questions. As soon as that number went up, you started sending questions and you haven't stopped. And I want to thank you for being so honest and so courageous. And I know in many ways it's vulnerable to ask for help. But we found that in this subject and with this issue, people have a lot of pain. It's what we care about the most, but it's oftentimes something we feel the least equipped to do. So on behalf of our team, I want to say thank you for sending those questions. We're going to try to answer as many as we can, but I want to also say thank you to you, Pastor Jeff and Brandy. It takes one level of vulnerability to send a question. It takes another level to answer a question. We've been friends a long time, and I know you guys aren't up here trying to say we have all the answers, but what I do know is your heart for families and your heart for people. We both have four kids. We talk about our families all the time. I know Maybe not everyone knows, but I know this isn't something you guys care about a couple weeks out of the year. You care about this all year long. You serve teams. You're trying to find the answers on our team. If someone needs help, you're the first to jump in and help. And so we want to say thank you for doing that. Thank you for serving. And really, thank you for bringing us back to the Bible. Because beyond just like tips and tricks, it's really God's word and his help that really allows us to, ha- to find peace and to find help in our homes. So thank you for doing that. Pastor Jeff, it is a big weekend, so I want to give you a chance to greet all the moms out there. Well, I do want to celebrate all of you moms. In fact, let's put our hands together yeah. one more time to celebrate all the moms, <laughs> celebrating all of you, maybe watching online, watching in the video venue as well. And we celebrate you. Mm-hmm. We, uh, we celebrate you all year long, but this is a special moment for us to just show you how much we value you, how much we're thankful for you. And so we celebrate you here on Mother's Day. And I put a blog out this week, in fact, and you can always go to life.milestonechurch. You can look at those blogs there where we show the stories of transformation that are happening all the time. But a little thought for you, and that is that you've never prayed a prayer that God has not heard and that he's with you. And I know a lot of times when you're in the trenches, Uh, It takes a little bit of an encouragement, so maybe you might want to go to that as a little special message from me to you to let you know that we're thinking about you and we value you. And I celebrate the mom in my home. Honey, you look beautiful today. It's awesome to be here with you as well. And we're going to have a big brunch and powerful Mother's Day here in a little bit, all right? It's awesome. All right, well, we'll get to some of these questions because we got a lot of them and we're going to do our best. We started uh, last week, as I mentioned, if you didn't get a chance to join us, you can go online and see the questions we started with last week, but I'll try to get to as many as possible. Pastor Jeff, we'll start with you. Marriage and family are really hard, especially when you don't feel like you have all the answers. I'm trying really hard to love my wife, but it doesn't seem to be working. What do I do? Well, first of all, this question is common. It's actually maybe sometimes we don't express it or don't exactly know how to put it into words what's going on, but this is one of the common breakdowns. And I would also say this message that really hits on uh, the answer to the question is one that is all throughout the family. And uh, when we begin to look at it and see how to get that breakthrough and that connection point, it it can affect your relationship with your children. It can affect you as a single person with your friendships. Mm -hmm. It can affect you in, in terms of how you relate to teams. And really, I'd like to take us to the scripture and show us that maybe the breakdown, and this is again for, for you, if you are in a major separation or you're just wanting to improve your marriage. And one thing we learn in these series is it takes intentionality to build a godly home. It takes energy. It takes effort. People say marriage is made in heaven, but it's built on earth. Come on. I mean, it takes work. And so what's an intentional step to increase the intimacy and connection in the home, in the relationship with children, or to really bring a first step if you're in polar places and separated right now? And I think the key answer is biblical love. Biblical love is, it's impossible to resist. Mm -hmm. It may seem like at first that there's a resistance, but over time, it's going to break down all of those walls in resistance. But here is where we're a lot of times coming up short, and what I would say to this gentleman with his wife, and that is, I've learned this, you're probably loving her in a way that makes sense to you, 
but doesn't make sense to her is not showing her love because she sees and receives love in a different way. The scripture says Paul writing in Colossians, he writes about just how we live and the key to relationships in general. He talks about having humility, having long suffering, having patience. Anybody raising any kids? Come on now. Patience, (laughs) patience. And so he says also forgiveness. Some of you, one of the big breakthroughs in your home would be to say to your children, how have I hurt you? Will you please forgive me? To say to your spouse, how have I hurt you? Will you please forgive me? You say, how do I do that? I don't even know how. Well, he tells us here, the only way you can forgive is to first understand how much you've been forgiven because Christ first forgave us. But he says some powerful things after that. And over all these virtues, these powerful truths and, and things that we need, he says, over all of it, put on love. He uses the terminology in this passage, clothe yourself with these things, put on love. So I see that as sometimes love is one of these things that's not just a fleeting feeling, it's something we have to intentionally put on and it may not be natural to us, that's why we have to put it on. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And we know when we have this unity around these principles of God and we have unity in our home, there's a commanded blessing But in 1992, Gary Chapman wrote a book that I think maybe some of you have seen, maybe some of you have not. It's been on the New York York Times bestseller list for many, many years, and I think because it's hitting a point that is so practical, and I know I've been impacted by it, and we all could use, even if we've seen it a little refresher, for some of you it may be new. He identifies five love languages. Mm -hmm. As a marriage counselor, and I can relate to him after working with people for many, many years, what he began to identify is is that the person may be saying, hey, I wanna show them love, I I don't like the separation, we keep having this tension, but again, not knowing how to show that love, he identifies the fact that we all, this is a step we can all take, do you know your spouse's love language? Do you know your child's love language? Do you know your relationships? Do you understand how to show them love? He gives five of them, number one, receiving gifts. If she says, it's not a big deal, Mother's Day, I don't want a gift, don't buy it. (laughs) Go get one right now. And if it's her love language, you're in deep trouble. Yes. Okay? Receiving gifts. The next one, words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. So showing love through words of affirmation. My wife went shopping this week, different, different outfits and things and pairing them all to look good for you. <laughs> okay. I'm doing this for you. Come on now. And, She's and, a, you. and me. Yeah. And look good for me. So today we get ready. Okay. She puts on this thing. How do you, how do you this think? Thing. How, this, <laughs> this shirt, this blouse. You're doing great. Just keep doing going. good. Like it looks good. She says, do you like the color? I said, it's, it's great. Is it purple? She says, no, it's fuchsia. <laughs> Like, At least what's you got that? it. You pronounced it right this Fuchsia? time. Fuchsia? You did. It wasn't in my 64 crayon. Okay, I don't know that color. So it's like fuchsia, and I'm like, it, it looks nice. It looks fuchsia shish. It's powerful. And so it's like words of affirmation, yeah. all right? Yeah. Then acts of service, okay? Yes. This is one of the, the strengths of my wife, which I love acts of service. You it's do. It works out really well. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times you show love by the way you were modeled love or the way you know to, you know, show love or maybe you, the way you receive love. Growing up, my mom was an acts of service person. Mm-hmm. I mean, the way she showed love to everyone was through bringing them a meal when they were sick. Mm-hmm. If, if someone asked you over for dinner, you brought a dish with you and you stayed and you cleaned up their whole house before you left, you know? <laughs> um, and that's how you showed them you loved them. And so that's how I learned to give love. And so that works out great since he's an acts of service guy. Um, I like physical touch too. That's coming up. <laughs> but that's a different message. Yeah. Come on, man. That's a different message. Yeah. Come on now. And ladies, that is one way you can show love to your man. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. But we're going to go back to yeah. acts of service. <laughs> acts of service. So one way that I show love to Jeff practically is every day I make him breakfast. Every day without fail. I make him breakfast because that speaks love to him. He wants the same thing every day. He wants a bowl of oats with no sugar, with blueberries and two eggs. 
sunny side up, right on top. And so, it's gross. <laughs> Keep it simple, man. I mean, you got all the basic components. Why change it but up? He loves it. Works for years. There are days that I'm like, I've got a meeting. I'm going to be late. I don't feel good. I don't feel... But I'm like, you know what? It doesn't take that long. And it's a practical way every day that when he wakes up, he has his breakfast with his coffee and he knows that I love him. So it's an easy thing I can do, even though sometimes it's a little inconvenient to show him that I love him. But because I was raised with acts of service and because my husband loves acts of service, um, I tend to try to do that with everybody. And so I remember for the first like 20 years of our marriage, we would go to his parents' house and we would be getting ready to leave. They lived several hours away and I would make my bed. I'd make their bed. I'd make anybody else's bed. Then I'd, you know, wash down the bathroom cabinets and then I'd vacuum to the point that I'm like, can y'all move your feet, you know? (laughs) And, um, you know, I remember one day they looked at me and they said, you know, Brandy, we can can vacuum our own house. (laughs) We'd rather you just sit down and visit with us. And when we left, my husband said, you know, that's just the way you show love, but the way they receive love is quality time. Mm -hmm. And they really do just want you to sit down and visit with them. And so that was a huge aha moment for me. Like I've been trying to love them in a way that they don't receive love. Mm -hmm. And and they just want me to sit down and visit. So it only took me 20 years, but I got there. (laughs) (laughs) Slow learner. (laughs) Physical touch and my wife's love language is quality time. So she wants me to turn off my phone, turn off my responsibilities to all of you, Mm-hmm. and focus totally on her. And there's times I do really good, there's times I've messed up, uh, but we've gotten better over the years. And we every week have a lunch together and I leave my phone in the car and focus with her. And, and we've got a, a son who's graduating here this coming week and we've got lots going on and we're teaching together. So that's a whole different level of, of different things throughout the week. And her, her most exciting moment here uh, over the last couple weeks is that we booked our beach vacation for the summer, the two of us, okay? Quality time, me, no cell phone. Here's what we're gonna do. Now I'm talking about learning to love, okay? Put it on. We're going there, okay? We hope none of you are there. <laughs> and then... We're going to wake up the first morning and she is going to have her bag and all her stuff and she is going to beat all the other people to the best chair. She's then going to come get me and we're going to sit there from daylight to dark. We're going to sit on the beach. And you say, what are you going to do the next day? We're going to get up at daylight and we're going to sit on the beach together. The third day, I will find a volleyball and draw a face on it. (laughs) And and I will say, do you want to play? And he'll say, yes. And I'll say, I can't because we're having quality time and we could play later, but not now. Okay. And so I, I, it doesn't register, but over time I learned that shows and it fills her tank Mm -hmm. for months at a time. If I will love her in the way that she wants to be loved. And so I think that that it is impossible to, to, to not build a deeper connection with right. your kids or your spouse or anyone when you love them the way they receive love because love covers a multitude of sins. Love draws us to the goodness of God, which leads us yeah. to repentance. Love is, God is love. It's a powerful, powerful force. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, I actually saw an example of this the other day. I was out returning something at the town square and I went into a store and I saw this couple and they just seemed like they were having fun together. They were just interacting and all of that. And, but they came up to me and they said, Brandy, we go to Milestone Church and we were just talking about the message and everything, but we're here, it's Mother's Day. And he was saying, I, this is her love language. Kendra Scott is her love language. Kendra Scott, so, baby, hey. <laughs> It doesn't have to be a surprise. She just loves to come and let, you know, I just let her shop and she gets what she wants and it's just how she receives love. And she was just beaming and and they were actually disappointed because they were supposed to go sing karaoke together. Before that, they had been practicing all day and they were gonna go have fun together, but it got canceled because it rained. So they were kind of disappointed, but they're like, but we just made, you know, we just decided to go to Brio's. It's right here. We're having a great time. And they were just beaming and um, just really just speaking each other's love language. It just seemed like they were having so much fun. But before I left, she said, I wanna tell you a story. She said, if you would have told me a year ago that we would be here doing this, I wouldn't have believed you. Because a year ago, I didn't think we were gonna make it. We were ready to get divorced. It just, there was no way I thought we would actually make it. And she said, I was kind of at my wits end and a neighbor 
um, and invited me to Milestone. So I came the next Sunday, started getting involved. But she said I would sit through the baby dedications and think, man, I wish my husband and I could be here together and we could dedicate our daughter. And she said, but after a while, he started coming, he got involved, he started going through the growth track and all of that. And this fall, we dedicated our daughter to the Lord and here we are and we are loving life, we're loving each other. And she said, I appreciate the fact that you're doing the family series because this is the kind of thing that was so pivotal as we were growing, as we were trying to make things work and, and get back together. And she said, we, we love it. We love each other and we are just so and happy. She came and she came weekend. up to me yeah. in the last service and she said, we just cried when you were talking about it. She's like, I can't believe you used my story. Um, and she said, it's just so meaningful what God has done in our life. And I thought, that's why we do what we do. Really that's why good. we do these series. Because we know, even if you think you're at your wit's end, that there's mm -hmm. no hope, that there is hope, there is that hope, God can right? turn things around. It's so good. Thank you for sharing that story. Because I know for many people, like the guy asking this question, it feels impossible, but just a little change, a little adjustment with the right heart, keep taking steps, God can do amazing things. All right, well, we got a bunch of questions, Brandy, about dating, okay. and so uh, we're gonna speak on this issue even more later in the series, but I thought we could start the dialogue with a couple questions about this today. I'm just gonna jump in, read this question. Uh, this young lady says, I need help, please. I've been with my boyfriend for five years. We're engaged and living together, and I keep pushing for us to get married, but he said he's not ready, and he's not sure because he doesn't want to make a mistake before God. I don't know what to do. We both go to Milestone. We both try our best to live right, but I have a plan and a goal for us and our future, and it feels like he doesn't. Why would he propose to me if he's not sure I'm the one I feel so lost? Okay, so let's unpack that for a minute. So what you've said is that you're five years in, you're engaged and you're living together and you're pushing to get married. You don't know why he doesn't know you're the one. So I started thinking about that as I was looking over this and I thought, well, are you the one? Are you the wrong one? Mm -hmm. Is he the wrong one? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But what I do see is that perhaps you're going about it the wrong way mm -hmm. and that you have the wrong method because the Bible says <clears throat> that a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they become one flesh. Mm -hmm. But see, you're already living together and you're joined intimately and financially, but you're not in a covenant relationship. So maybe the reason you're having so much problem is because you're just not going about it God's way. Now, honestly, you probably don't even know that. 66% of people live together before marriage. Wow. Culturally, that's normal, right. that it's not biblical. Right. And so my encouragement to you would say, okay, wait a second, whatever we've been doing, let's stop and let's see what the Bible says mm -hmm. about it. Let's see what the Bible says about dating, relationships, um, how to love God and honor Him and everything that we do. And then let's see what He says. Because the problem is you cannot discard God's word and expect to be in the center of His will. Hmm. So you have to look at what his word says about it. So you may have to say, okay, we're gonna push reset. We're gonna start over, okay? And you say, well, we've already done it for five years. Like we've been in this whole thing and to start over, what do you mean? I don't wanna go any longer. I would rather go longer and build stronger mm -hmm. and make the process a little bit so that you can stand the test of time. It's good. So that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's what God has called, that there's no question that you're making. You know, because the thing is, I feel like when you said, we don't wanna make a mistake before God, you're wanting to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You just need a little bit of guidance. So reset, say, God, what do you say about this? And the thing is that I love is, okay, so we've been doing this for five years. No matter where you are, you can always start fresh with God. Good. His mercies are new every morning. It's really good. So this is what we've been doing, but we're gonna start over, we're gonna do it God's way, and then see if we hear God speak a little more clearly about it. It's great, that's so good that God's not punishing us. That's worth clapping. It's not about, hey, all these wrong things. Start fresh new, get a, a fresh vision, a, a fresh way to think about it. Okay, Pastor Jeff, here's a follow-up. I love this, one young lady said she'd love to hear you guys talk about singleness, what you're doing. And she said, uh, she feels sometimes, as a single person who's dating, sometimes here at Milestone, in, in, in her demographic, she feels kind of like a minority, because there's lots of married couples and young families, and, and so she was like, hey, don't forget about us, we're out here, and she, you know, I love her, she has a great heart. She says, I love Milestone, I love that we're in every one church, and she said that she's waiting on God to provide her husband. Maybe my favorite part of her question, she put in parentheses, come on, dude, where are you, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> we, we like that. Here's how she finished her question. How do you find the right spouse? What should dating look like? 
Well, I think this is an important question for all of us because whether you're in that phase or you are a parent or a grandparent or a friend, then you are a part of someone's life in this phase of life. I know I'm in that phase with my son will be 18 tomorrow. I have a 19 year old, I have one going into high school. So I'm in the process of people that I love that I'm praying for uh, consistently for this decision. It's an important decision. And we want you to know if you're a single person, and this is coaching for everybody. You come into an environment and sometimes from your vantage point, see from my vantage point, I see all of you mm -hmm. and there's people from all different ethnic backgrounds and social backgrounds and age demographics. There's empty nesters and there's a lot more singles than you think because I shake all your hands. Um, really, uh, again, so don't always come in just based on your proximity to where you are, identify an environment in a certain way. And so singles sometimes have a tendency to over identify with that singleness, but we understand where you're at and we want right. you to know we see you, we care about you, it's a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. I've helped multiple people before I had children or as I've had young children, help them with this life decision. And so we're for you, mm -hmm. we're believing for you, um, we're believing for that guy. You know, quit playing video games, get a job and marry the girl. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> We're looking for you, sir. Yeah. Um, so we're with you. We're with you yeah. 110%, yes. right? And so um, you say, well, okay, now I'm kind of looking. What does that look like? Well, I think back to intentionality. Yeah. I mean, one thing you'll hear is a consistent theme. In today's world, everybody has opinions. Right. Yeah. Come back to the authority of this word every single time. Mm -hmm. Do it God's way. And as, as Brandy said so well, and then you'll have God's blessing. Mm -hmm. So don't think about, hey, what do we do? Think about what does God bless? Mm -hmm. And what God blesses is a pattern according to his word. And if you're single, you, for a lot of you, I wanna encourage you with this. You may be single because you've chosen to be single. Mm -hmm. You go, what do you mean by that? You're like, I wanna be married. But maybe you've chosen to marry someone who shares your values. And if you've made that choice, right. good choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good choice, because you can just get married you know, you know, go to Vegas and get Elvis to marry. Love me tender. <laughs> no, I mean, you could just kind of do whatever, but you've made a righteous choice. God's with you. And you say, what do I do practically? Well, you, you, you probably have a list. And I know sometimes maybe the list can be too much because we think it's got to be all perfect. You kind of sort that out with God. But what I would say about on your list, don't compromise the character pieces. Mm -hmm. right. The core character value pieces. Yeah. Is this person submitted to God. Is this person submitted to God's word? Do they have convictions? Convictions drive behavior. And so if you think, well, they'll just somehow change, most of the time not. And so if they have convictions here, then they're gonna have convictions in marriage. How do they treat others? How do they live sexually? You think, well, they'll just change because we get married. No, if they will live with you, if they will sleep with you, then they don't have sexual integrity. They may not have sexual integrity in other areas even after you're married. So you're looking for sexual integrity. You're looking for financial integrity. Do they tithe? You go, why is that a big deal? Well, the Bible says those that don't tithe are robbing from God. If they'll rob from God, they may rob from you. Are they engaged with this church? Are they serving others? Are they giving their, so put together some of those character principle things and the Bible says he who delights himself in the Lord mm -hmm. he will give you the desires of your heart mm -hmm. it's a godly desire right. and we're with you and the biggest thing I would say too, where there's a multitude of counselors the Bible says plans do not fail so get some godly people who have a great marriage mm -hmm. and say hey will you help me with this decision just help me in the journey help me talk about this. Help me relate in, in this situation. And, and so with some intentionality, then uh, statistics say, we're trusting God, not statistics, but the majority of people do end up married. And so uh, we're standing with you and believing for God's best. Okay. So good. Well, I, I think a lot of times people in that season of life feel like they're limited by their options, but it reminds me of what you said in week one, you know, a vision for your future gives you power in your present. Like right now, you, you might be thinking, well, I'm a single person. Th this part about fa uh, families and raising kids, that doesn't have anything to do with me. Absolutely it does because it helps you form the vision of the kind of person that you're looking for yes. and where you're trying to go. We can all learn from yes. different seasons of life when our vision is clear of where we're trying to go. Okay, uh, Pastor Jeff, here's another great question. It's a simple one, but I think so important. How do you create a culture of honor in your home? 
I think that's a great question because I think it's incredibly important. And we're seeing that as I talk to teachers and police officers. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a group of teachers this week and they said, in the last five years even, they've seen a downward slide in the way children relate to authority figures. And I understand that people may have been hurt by authority or other things and we're not advocating that. But, but in general, we need a higher establishment of the principles of scripture to honor those that God has put in authority over us. And we need to teach this to our children. And the first place they learn it is in the home. Yeah. And how you have a home that has honor in it is we start with we honor God. Right. We honor God. He's the supreme authority. He's God and he's God all by himself. Mm -hmm. And we're not God. Right. And we honor his word. And then we honor one another. So the way mom and dad honor each other filters down to honor in the home right. as well. So my kids, you might think, pa Pastor Jeff, you sound like you're a difficult dad. I'm kind of a fun dad a little bit. I kind of have a few things that are non-negotiables. One of those is you don't disrespect my wife. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't disrespect this woman, okay? You will honor her. You will respect her. And, and so you establish that. So I have to honor. I honor, and then that filters down into the home. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. By the way, we're all in this verse right here. So if you're a child, you need to learn obedience. You need to teach your children obedience because if they learn how to obey, they learn how to respect authority, then that helps them later in life, but they learn it in your home. For this is right. Then, look at this, we're all in this. Honor your father and mother. Children obey, but everyone honors. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. I've never met a person, even someone who does not worship God, who doesn't say, I want my kids to be happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want my kids to be blessed. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what it says. Here's a promise for your children. So that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. When we teach our children to honor and obey, then we're actually enacting a promise and a blessing from the word of God into their lives. And so I wanna encourage you with that in, in terms of setting and establishing honor. Um, I wanna just give one little practical here that I, I just wanna offer to you something I've had to learn. Um, I, I felt like I was a better parent of younger kids and thank God for some mentors and some help and some coaching, but it, it's a difficult transition and we work through it with our children, but when they move from children obey your parents, to young adolescents and moving into adulthood to where they're moving more into this honor phase, but it's not about do this, do this, do this, and everything's in the box. Mm -hmm. And this is challenging for our culture because we have real driven dads and moms and we have their whole world put together and we do real good at trying to teach some conformity yeah. in some ways. I'm talking to Christian parents here. You know, we got their little lunch boxes and their monogram and all their little things and we clear everything. And, and one person said we moved from helicopter parents to now we're Navy SEAL parents. So we're going in ahead of the, wow. ahead of the battalion. So we're removing any barrier for all, for our kids. We're calling the teacher. We got to stop that. Mm -hmm. I know people are calling their kids college professors that this is not good. Okay. Teach them to learn how to honor you, honor their authorities and work out their challenges with their own friends, work out their challenges with their teachers, work these things out. And what happens is, I'm not talking about rebellion. Rebellion can really destroy a child's life. I'm not talking about rebellion, which can come sometimes from rules without relationship or pain in the child's life from hurt, okay? Yeah. It can come from a lot of different things. I'm not talking about let them have freedom in terms of moral choices or, or the word of God, but I am talking about the expression of adulthood that begins to emerge, emerge in their lives. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like to say it this way, we all talk about we want our kids to change the world, we just hate it when they change our world. Mm -hmm. Right. We're like, we wanna raise lions, but we cage them like house cats. Right. I'll tell you something, leaders do not conform all the time, and yes, there is disrespect when you don't obey rules and follow patterns, but sometimes you may be getting some dishonor, but it's because they're looking for some freedom, and here's one way we can do that honor them with being able to start adulting a little bit instead of controlling their lives all the time, mm -hmm. okay? And love them in a way that, that they wanna uh, and need to receive love 
along the way. But honor is a big deal. It is a big deal. And adulting didn't used to be a verb. Yeah. Right. It used to just be a noun. Like you, one day you were growing into an adult and became yeah. an adult, you know, but now we have to teach our kids to adult. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> but it's hard because as they do that, they need more freedom and that, that scares us a little bit. But you know, there's this transition that happens um, when they're adolescents and they're growing into their teenage years. And so many things are physiological that are happening with them. So as women, as moms in the home, we understand our girls because we are one. And so when they start getting a little emotional all of a sudden, you know, for no reason, or they get, you know, angry at a certain time of the month, we're like, oh, (laughs) this is about to start happening on a regular basis, okay. And so we're prepared for that. We can kind of understand that in our mind. It's an easier transition for us. We don't always understand our boys. And as you have a young man that's growing into his teenage years, into adulthood, he undergoes some changes too. And I've heard so many of my moms, so many of my friends say, He's just angry all the time. He's so mad. He's like mad at me, he's mad at his dad, he's mad at the world. And I'm like, he really isn't. He's getting this thing called testosterone. (laughs) And it's this thing that's gonna help him become a man one day. But right now, this surge of it, he doesn't understand what to do with it. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even know why he's mad. He might think it's over this or that, but he's waking up every day feeling mad and he doesn't even know why. So if you'll just explain it to him, like, hey, the reason you're feeling this way It's because you're getting testosterone, you're growing into a man, and as you're growing into a man, I'm gonna start treating you a little bit more like that. I'm gonna give you some more um, freedom, a little bit more responsibility, all of those things. And then you give him the freedom of just knowing that. Number one, it sets him free, because he's wondering why he's waking up mad every day. Mm -hmm. And it sets you free to understand what's going on. So some things are just physiological, and you have to understand that and embrace it as it happens. I think it's so great. Really, the picture you guys are painting of a culture of honor And really the young people understanding how freedom and responsibility and consequences all work together. Well, one area where this is so poignant for all of us as families is the area of technology. Uh, It's a huge part of all of our lives. It's not going away. And we got this question in multiple forms. How do we help our children learn how to handle technology responsibly? Then this is such a tricky question because technology is so all encompassing and there's so much of it and it's going and changing so fast it's hard to keep up with it. But what we know is that it can be a blessing but it can also be very detrimental. And some of us see the pitfalls because we understand what it was like before technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think email was new when we were dating, right? So it was like we got to email each other. It was like, you know, but it was like dial up. Your parents couldn't be on the phone at the time or, you know. Um, So we know, we can see the before and the after. But this generation, all they know is technology. All they know is social media. And so they think everything associated with that is normal. Mm -hmm. It's normal to be friends with somebody on social media and not talk to them if you see them in the hall, Mm -hmm. like face to face. And we're like, what, why would you do that, you know? Um, But that's, that's their norm. And so we have to help them set up guards, safe, you know, safety rails, if you will, in this area. We have to understand that there are filters, there are, um, you know, controls, parental controls that you can put on it. They don't have to have Safari on their phone. And especially when they're young, you know, that's one of those things, you don't have to go looking for anything bad. Mm-hmm. It comes to you. Right. And they can search something totally innocent and it can change their life. You can't unsee some things, right? We know pornography is a huge, huge problem with technology and they don't have to go looking for it. They'll find it everywhere they turn if we're not careful. You know, in our house, we set up a contract with our kids and we say, hey, this is what, you know, this is the contract. You're not gonna be able to use your phone after this time. You know, if you see something, if you hear something, if something's going on, you need to let us know. Um, And as long as we're communicating about it and you're being honest with about it, we can deal with that. But at any point, you break this contract. See, another question we got in regards um, to, to child raising was how do you raise kids that aren't entitled? And that's, I mean, we could spend a whole day on that, but one of the things I see in one area that it's prevalent is kids feel entitled to technology. Mm -hmm. They feel entitled to a phone. Well, all my friends have a phone, or my older sibling had a phone at this age, Mm -hmm. so I should have a phone at this age. And it's like, because you're cute? Like, why do you, you know? But we start, we train our kids in this from an early age. We'll take them to Target, Mm -hmm. and we'll say, if you'll just be good, we'll get you a toy when we leave. So next thing you know, every time you go to Target, you're having to get them a toy to be good. No, you don't. 
you don't, you know, have the right to a toy because you were good. You get the satisfaction of knowing that you did the right thing. Yay. <laughs> and you get to not have consequences when we get home. <laughs> you know, you don't, you're not entitled to a toy for being good. But now we think, well, I'm entitled to this because everybody else has it or because how would I ever get a hold of you if I needed you, right? I don't know. We did it for 20 something years. You know, we were fine. Um, and so I would tell them and help them to understand technology is not a right, it's a privilege. Mm -hmm. And at any time that you're not responsible, honest, open, communicating, that you're doing things behind the scenes, that privilege can be taken away. It's not your right. And so I've had friends, I remember when Instagram was new, um, one of my um, kids, I was kind of following all their, you know, all their friends, and I was pretty naive to Instagram in the beginning and the woes and the, and the things that could happen with that, but I noticed that one of their friends was posting some just really inappropriate stuff, so I happened to be talking to their mom one day, and I said, hey, like, do you ever look at your child's Instagram by chance? And she said, oh, no, she doesn't give me her passwords, and she, as a matter of fact, she's locked up in her room right now with her phone. And I said, what? She doesn't give you her, pa if she doesn't give you her password, she doesn't have a phone. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't let you in her room, I'd unscrew that doorknob right now and I'll tell you right now, that's my house, my room. You're not locking yourself in there with your technology. Because we're the parents and we're right. responsible to help them through this and navigate it because it is not going away. So we have to understand the pitfalls. Besides the things that they can see, there's a higher level of anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. sleep deprivation, the things that it causes, and we have to be responsible in the fact that we have to know what they're doing, how much they're using it, and provide those safeguards so that they can do it responsibly and healthily, and we have to protect them, so. So good. Well, I think a lot of kids are looking for help because like you said, the anxiety's up, the challenges are up, but it's interesting, you look at the research, a lot of researchers say, we, they go to kids, they're like, do you want help with this? Do you get help from your parents? And they're like, our parents? Our parents are on our phone more than we are, right? Like 43% of families have zero screen limitations at all in our country today. So we're, we're struggling to figure out how this works. Pastor Jeff, help us with this. In our world of technology, at the touch of a button, what can we do, this is a parent asking, what can we do to safeguard our marriage from unfaithfulness? What I, what I think is everybody needs accountability. Right. Every, every, my biggest statement would be, wherever you're at with this subject, go up to another level if right. you have kids in your house. Right. Wherever you're at, go up to another level. What's interesting is, 43% of families have no limitation to screen time, but the people who invented all this stuff that we have, they don't, even use, they don't it, yeah. use it in their house. That's right. So That's it's true. an interesting, when you really study it, right. they understand the effects that it can have. And I know it's not going away, and I'm not an anti-using sure. technology, but I do believe everybody at all ages needs some parameters, needs some accountability. And the number one thing I would say, you know, especially to men here, if, if your spouse yeah. Uh, can't see your phone or your technology, there's a problem. Right. Um, and my, my phone's, you know, my computer, I mean, my wife has full access to it, my team. It's very routine that my team would take my phone and, in a meeting and say, let's put this in. I mean, I, I think we need to have full transparency and every one of us yeah. need a measure of accountability. And if it's something that you are struggling with, then you should have even more of an increased accountability uh, in your life. It's really good. Well, we're running out of time or we're out of time. And I know there was a, a question that we got a bunch of that you wanted to touch on, Pastor Jeff. So l let me give it to you quickly. What do healthy relationships look like for grandparents? We had a lot of these grandparents. Let me say to grandparents, if your children are not following God, I want you to know that we're in agreement and we're in prayer with you regarding your children. Yeah. There's no pain like kid pain. And I know a lot of times you can even listen to these series. I hear people all the time say, I wish somebody would have told me this 20 years ago. Yeah. Young people, you should listen to that. Mm -hmm. You should say, man, I mean, these, there are people that are further down the road going, I wish I would have been more intentional mm -hmm. about some of these things and so get a vision for your home. But I do have a heart for those of you that are grandparents who so you want this, but you don't have that dynamic and, um, and, and we're praying with you. And there's the story of the prodigal son in the Bible where we see the love of God is so strong to, to bring even a wayward kid home. But I think uh, another practical for those that are involved with, with Christian 
parents and homes and you're wanting to create a greater flow between the two of you, here's just a little tip, okay? Because I, I had several of the questions where parents like, we want to tell them this or they do this different or they do that. Can I encourage you with something? The Bible says they leave and cleave. They leave your home and they're to honor you, but they don't obey your way of doing everything. Mm -hmm. And so one way to get more uh, just openness with your children is to respect the values that they place in the home. So when the kids are at your house, respect the values of the parents. Now we get it, you get more cookies at grandma's house, come on now, yeah. we get it. Sugar, you sugar them up so we can try to figure out how to put them to bed at two a.m. <laughs> but anyway, it, that's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about to teach the children to honor. Mm -hmm. You should do that with your children that are married. They made a covenant with that person. You should always agree with the covenant relationship and not take favoritism even with your own child in a godly Christian home. And so if you'll do that and honor them, then they'll honor you, they'll give you more access. Here's the final thing I'm gonna say about family, let's talk family. Here at Milestone, we have a value called spiritual family. Yes. And I realize it's challenging when you have a lot of parental urges, like you just love to parent. I love to parent. I just, you know, the Bible says you have many teachers, but you don't have many fathers. So I, I've been, you know, fathering people when I, but before I was married, I was a pastor. So I, I know there's some of you like that and you're kind of like, wow, they left, they're cleaving and I don't have a lot, you know, I wish I could have the grandkids every day and, and that kind of thing. So here's my, my connection. And so you've learned a lot. We need you in the game in the area of spiritual family. That's the power of spiritual right. family, is there are a whole generation of fatherless young people who would love someone like you to mentor them, to have a small group with them, to help them with their dating relationships, to pray for them, to encourage them. I think about right now a lady in our church who had a national platform singing with crowds of people in stadiums, and a few years ago she started just bringing young ladies into her home, feeding them a little bit, and just talking to them about being a mom, about being a wife, about their marriage, about their future marriage, and she would say it's been the most rewarding thing in her entire life. And so I would just encourage all of you, there's always a place in the kingdom of God for all of us to participate in a healthy way in family, okay? We're all part of the team, okay? Good. Here's what I wanna do finally. I wanna ask the moms, if you would, to stand on your feet. All moms, stand on your feet. I wanna pray for you. Come on now, let's give them another big round of applause, all the moms. And I know there are some of you that are, I know there are some of you, we pray for people in fertility. We pray for those of you that wanna be a mom. I wanna celebrate all of you that are moms. Father, I pray for your blessing. I pray that below this verse where it says for us to put on love, no one in the family, more times than not, models the love and the unconditional acceptance of God to us than our moms. And in this putting on of love, the, the, the below that verse though, it says, let the peace, this peace that comes from you, Jesus, let it rule. And I pray that that was what would happen right now, even in this moment, as they leave this service, peace would rule in their hearts. As they think, am I doing it right? There's so much I have to do. So much of, of what they do is give away of themselves and little time for themselves. But I pray that you would grant them a blessing of peace and strength, and Lord, you would walk with them, encourage them, and show them today how much they are loved by you, and we honor our moms in Jesus' name, amen.